Hi, everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on, on where you may be joining us from. And welcome to today's discussion. Uh, today we are joined, we're very happy to be joined by some of the authors of this year's State of Power, which is titled Coercive World. Um, my name is Niamh Nivreen from the Transnational Institute, and I will be co-moderating uh, the discussion this evening, or this afternoon, this morning, uh, with my colleague Nick Buxton. Um, for the, those of you who may be joining to, uh, this discussion or joining a TNI event for the first time, um, TNI is a critical thinking research and activism uh, institute based in Amsterdam, and we're committed to transformative change and social justice. Um, and uh, today we're celebrating, in fact, that the, this is 10 years and this is the 10th edition of our annual State of Power report, which has become our flagship publication. Um, and so we're delighted, like I said, to be joined by some of the authors um, of this year's uh, uh, publication um, to discuss some of the main themes that came out in, in the essays that we gathered. Um, so the way the discussion today will, will take shape is that we'll give a brief presentation of the state of power as it has been over the last 10 years, and that will be with the video. Um, and then we'll invite our speakers to intervene um, giving them some time to present three or four of the main points from their from the essays they submitted. And then we'll open up the discussion for some exchange um, and some interaction between the speakers and, and ourselves as moderators. And also we'll encourage you to, to use the chat function in Zoom um, or the question and answer function where you can where you can also uh, post some questions and hopefully we'll get around to answering them. The idea is that we get through all of this in an hour. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we will kick off with the video, like I said, and then I will pass the discussion over to Nick Buxton, who will be co-moderating um, and introducing the speakers. But for now, uh, Jess, I think you have a video ready, so we'll, we'll move to the video. Thank you. Thank you, Neve. Um, I'm Nick Buxton, as, as Neve just mentioned, and I'm the co-editor and also one of the founders of this State of Power report. Um, and I think as the video really showed, um, we this was a really collaborative uh, our project to have been involved in uh, because it brought together both some really um, amazing writers, researchers, 
activists and even photographers to really reflect on some of the key issues that shape the reality for so many of our struggles for justice. I think our conviction when we started this whole project to state of power was that underlying every struggle for justice today is an issue of power. Who has power? How are they using that power? And for what purpose and with what effect? Who should have power? And more importantly, as movements, how do we build power and transform power relationships to build a more just, sustainable world? So we've been exploring that uh, way that power intersects with so many of our struggles over a series of issues. And as the video mentioned, the focus for, our, our, for this year was looking at coercive state power. And it was not inspired by academics so much as inspired by the streets and the way that the Black Lives Matter movement uh, really radically opened up a new public conversation about policing and also more broadly about the coerce or coercive state agencies. So we wanted to kind of take the look um, and stretch that out uh, beyond policing to, to really the, the different coercive state agencies that we had. And we were really thrilled. Um, we do a call for papers and we were thrilled by the responses we got to our call for, for papers, which came in from all over the globe. Unfortunately for today, we I'd have loved to have brought all, all the authors together um, but, but that wasn't possible with the time we have. Um, but we're really delighted by the, by the few who have been able to join us, particularly, and we're joined today by Arun Kunani, Olufemi Taiwo, uh, Nik Nora Mirales, and Philippe Dasa, and uh, Nikita Soanani, and Strujana Bej. Um, and we'll, we'll introduce them again in a bit more detail um, when we get to, the, to their inputs. Um, and we've asked our speakers really not to kind of repeat or summarize their whole essay. We hope some of you have had a chance uh, to already read some of them, but to really draw out three or four of the key threads, dynamics or challenges they see in the nature of coercive power today that they feel are most relevant for emancipatory movements to reflect on and strategize around. So I'd like to start this conversation, um, this very exciting conversation to have, um, an important one is with Arun Kanani. Arun is a TNI associate and he's a writer on race and racial capitalism. Um, he is um, the author of The Muslims Are Coming, Islamophobia, Extremism and the Domestic War on Terror, which was published by Verso in 2014. Um, and he's a frequent writer. And for our report, he wrote a, a provocative piece called Abolish National Security. So Arun, over to you. Uh, thank you, Nick. And um, yeah, thanks for everyone who, who worked on this. This is um, a, a terrific volume that, that I found very useful um, in lots of ways. And I think um, what, what I found especially useful about it is, is how it allows us to think about the kind of state power that has been generated in, um, in this particular kind of period of capitalism that we've been living under for the last few decades. Um, how so it's, it enables us to see i think how um the politics of state violence connects to the economics of of neoliberal global capitalism um and that's incredibly useful so be, i mean i think especially because you know globalization and neoliberalism or, you know whatever you there's sort of a range of words we could use here but those kinds of projects were hailed when they were when they were initiated as um, as ways of safeguarding us against um, totalitarianism, against state oppression and so forth. And yet what, what this volume clearly demonstrates is that the opposite has happened. Um, the power of the state is greater than ever. Um, the police have become armies. Um, borders have become fortresses. Um, much of the world lives in a permanent state of war. And um, so, so, you know, and this is the question that opens the, the very first chapter. Um, uh why has state authoritarianism and co coercive power increased over the last 50 years we get we get um th some interesting answers from um olufemi taiwo and the chilean bembe there but actually that that question runs right through the uh right through the volume um uh whether you know whether we look at um aldo oriana lopez's piece on extractivism which talks about how um you know in in the extractive kind of form of capitalism which is which is you know central to capitalism and and, and growing um have a dispossession and pillaging of 
of land and primary resources, say in, in Peru or in Colombia, requires a state power that is that is able to secure that kind of extraction um, in opposition to the people whose lives are actually bound up with that land and um, with the resources of it. Um, uh, you know, in a different example, um, Amaya Bokil, Nikita Sonovane, and, and Srijana Bej's piece on, um, on, on how structural hierarchies organized through caste in India um, are linked to specific forms of informal labor, right? Where the, the kind of security of, of wage labor is never available to specific groups. And, and then how that then in, in our time gets linked to digitally driven uh, forms of policing aimed at managing those, those populations, right? And so um, we could go on, but in all these cases, what we see is that, you know, if we can use this word neoliberalism, is that neoliberalism renders um, you know, vast swathes of, of, of human populations essentially superfluous to, um, to capitalist production, and then also codes those surplus populations in terms of fixed group differences, such as race, such as caste, such as indigeneity, and so on. And, and the, the kind of expanding projects of policing, incarceration, border militarization, counterterrorism, counter narcotics, um, are, are actually directed at managing these surplus. Uh, this surplus humanity under neoliberalism, and the result, as we as we know, is is you know the warehousing of of, of millions of people in prisons, um, the huge death tolls in the in the in the seas and deserts um, that surround the wealthy nations um, as a result of borders, the the needless deaths of millions as a result of the um, global infrastructures of the war on terror and the war on drugs, and and I think what this volume tells us is you know, in that way that neoliberalism is not just an economic project of redistributing resources from um, poor to rich. Um, it's not, you know, it's not, the neoliberal state is not the minimal state that, that some people have spoken about, but it's um, a, an ever expanding kind of state violence is bound up with neoliberalism and it's, it, that involves racism, casteism and other systems of social differentiation, right? And I think, um, you know, there's a there's a quote from Alan Greenspan that I refer to in my piece, uh, the former former chair of the US Federal Reserve that kind of points to this. This is from 2007. He said, um, thanks to globalization, policy decisions in the US have been largely replaced by global market forces. Um, national security aside, it hardly makes any difference who will be the next president. OK. Um, so in other words, what he's saying there, and I think he's absolutely right, is, is that you know, with economic policy subsumed to, to global markets, um, uh, how do neoliberal government derive consent from, from um, the people they rule over? Um, uh, well, it's not gonna be through increasing their material well-being because market, market forces don't allow that. So instead, national security becomes the, the, the only space in which, um, in which some kind of narrative of legitimacy can be um, developed um, for a neoliberal state. And so you legitimize yourself by claiming, you know, gov neoliberal governments legitimize themselves by claiming to protect their citizens from, you know, myriad dangers, right? And, um, and, the, and the kind of racially marked populations who've been dispossessed by neoliberalism around the world are then cast as the, these new sources of danger that become figures in that narrative. So that's whether that's as terrorists or as migrants or as criminals or whatever. And, and, and so neoliberal politics becomes a kind of contest between parties competing over who can identify these threats and, uh, uh, and, and implement kind of spectacles of violence in response. And, and so the result is a kind of, political culture that's bent out of shape, national security with its overbearing presence that, that maintains a fantasy of domination, but actually avoids coming to terms with the, the actual structural failures of neoliberalism. Um, what can we do in response? You know, all of the essays point to um, the movements that um, are taking on these structures. Um, the answer to, to how we do that is gonna depend on the context of where we're at. Here in the US, as, as uh, Nick was just speaking about, you know, that we can derive some hope from um, the movement of people um, on the streets um, uh -huh. in the last 12 months, 15 million people uh, participated in those black led multiracial protests last summer against, against police violence. And I think um, in my piece, I try to spell out how we can build on that to, to move towards a wider kind of dismantling of, of our one over $1 trillion a year um, so-called national security system. 
Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Arun, for, for that intervention. Um, I think Arun has, has set up the the political landscape that that we're that we're discussing our, our themes within today. So thank you for that, Arun. Um, I'm going to move on and invite our next speaker to join the discussion. So I'd like to invite Nora Miralles, um, and also recognize Felipe das, Philippe Dasa, um, who's joining. They're sharing the floor today, and both Philippe and Nora are uh, part of a fantastic resource called Shock Monitor. Um, they're both based at the Observatory and Corporations and Human Rights in the Mediterranean which maps and tracks the activities of private military and security companies worldwide. Um, and their essay is, uh, is, uh, is a revelation on, on the role of privatization of security uh, in, today's, in today's world. So Nora, I'll ask you to, to give us a few of your points from, from, the, from the essay, and then we'll come back to Philippe in the, in the second round. So thank you, Nora. Thank you to, to you, Niamh, and me to invite us. Uh, okay, so totally following with Aaron, was outlining not only massive expansion of prisons and migrant detention centers are integral part of neoliberalism because of the need, no, that need to manage this surplus, but also because security is an increasingly profitable business. So states outsource increasing number of their roles and, and responsibilities, leaving them at the mercy of, of profit, no, rather than prioritizing the public interest. And so the progressive privatization of the state role in security and by extension in, in coercive power is part of a worldwide phenomenon of deregulation and states hide the weakness through enacting criminal laws and increasing military spending and building walls. And they take refuge in the rhetoric and practice of security showing that they are still in control and that they have still some sovereignty left while ironically outsourcing security functions to private corporations. So security has become both a legitimation for the state and another source of profit maximization. And we consider that understanding this complex and seemingly contradictory nexus is critical to understanding coercive power today and, and how, it is, how this is exerted. So one of the consequences of this outsourcing of security to, to private hands is the expansion of functions and, and power of private military and security companies. Um, they, are, they are penetrating the internal security you know, apparatus and, and using force in, in public safety context, which is pretty you know, worried. And you all probably know uh, what uh, private military security companies are, no? uh, governments often refer them as private security companies, but they have uh, military functions and, and often operational capacity. So they are different, they are different from security companies. And regarding their use in conflict as mercenaries, there has been no reduction in the use of PMS of, of this kind of companies uh, since the Cold War ended. And more on the contrary, you know, they, they have been uh, really involved in, in foreign affairs you know, apparatus of the state. Uh, we have an example in the proxy wars in, in Libya and Syria, you know, where third countries have been participating by contracting these non-state uh, armed actors, even in both sides, not just you know, in one. So uh, also they have become uh, this this extension of states and government justify this policy in terms of efficiency by claiming that it is a strategy to reduce military spending uh, don't you want not to reduce military spending but because it's, 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 it is not necessary to maintain these military contractors in peacetime but reality is that the use of these companies allows governments to intervene in, in armed conflicts while avoiding public scrutiny and and, avoid, and avoiding international regulations, since there is not a binding system for holding them accountable or any transparency you know, regarding the, their services. Also, uh, which is more you know, worrying under, under our perspective, uh, contracts with government and transnational corporations are allowing these security companies to to reinforce the extractivist economic logic in many armed conflicts, like in Colombia or in Mozambique, you know, with um, French TN, uh, TNC total. But beyond foreign conflicts and war zones, what maybe we didn't know 
uh, where that the range of services they are offering now is progressively broader and it's including uh, providing domestic security services alongside or instead of state owned security forces in border control, protecting critical infrastructure, patrolling public spaces, prison security management, intelligence, or cybersecurity. No? Among, the, among the most worrying trends, there is the role in maintaining public order. They're, they are increasingly being used not just to guard elite housing, no? um, but also public spaces. No? In some cases, such as in Cape Town, they are uh, evicting people from public. Uh, from public areas, as for instance, but probably the, the aspect of their involvement in public security that sparks the greatest opposition and alarm is privatization of prisons, uh, internment facilities and migrant detention centers, especially because some of the largest companies that are winning this kind of contracts have a long history of complaints about degrading treatment, forced labor, abuse, sexual violence, violence in general. No? Uh, and finally, regarding intelligence and cybersecurity, uh, agencies are contracting these corporations. Um, that's nothing new, but these services have evolved and now include supply and maintain software technology and hardware systems, gathering data related to national security, intercepting calls, hacking mobile phones, analyzing uh, that data related to national security, operating drones, and even conducting secret operations that involve illegal activities or irregular activities, infiltrating social movements. So they are having access to extremely sensitive and private information of citizens and activists, no? compromising right to privacy. Um, um, and that the, the outsourcing of security by government and their agencies, it's not only efficiency, for us it's also ideology, is a deliberate process and it's also very dangerous for civil and political rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nora. Um, it's, it is such a, a critical trend within this whole report, the whole privatization of security, and it kind of very much complements what and the kind of broader neoliberal context that Arum was talking about. Um, it also is an, it's also a theme that's explored a little bit um, by our next speaker and in their piece, uh, Nikita Sovanan, and um, she's also gonna be joined by Sujana Bedge, um, who will kind of respond to some of the questions, but they, they, they have a fascinating story about uh, the role of a corporation called Honeywell um, and and its role in the kind of whole surveillance system in Bhopal. Um, and in their essay, they very much explored the way it kind of both looks back and looks forward. It looks back at how colonialism really shaped, has shaped policing in India and how now digitalization is accelerating. And in both cases, uh, leading to a continued um, oppression and marginalization of people of lower castes. So over to you, Nikita. Look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, thank you, Nick. Uh, very glad to be here. So I'm presenting our essay today on behalf of my co-authors. Uh, I think one of the most uh, key things and something that is at the heart of our piece is something uh, that one of our respondents from the Parthi community, uh, which is a denotified tribal community, a community that was, uh, you know, criminalized by the British as a criminal tribe, uh, said, "Angres chale gaye, hamare liye police chhod gaye," which in Hindi means the British are gone, but they have left their police behind. Uh, what she said, in essence, sums up what is the legacy of the institution of policing, and something that continues to remain relevant and the digitization and what are the sort of implications that digitization has on what is essentially uh, a colonial construct. So what we, I want to talk about today is just talk about, like Nick said, that the piece looks forward and is also backward looking in terms of really historicizing the institution of policing, right? So like I said, this is of course a colonial construct uh, but it's also an institution that is very, very deeply rooted and entrenched uh, in the institution of caste, which is uh, in so many ways the genesis of power in the Indian subcontinent, right? Our lives, occupation, 
are organized according to this institution of caste and these communities that were indigenous communities you know several nomadic and semi nomadic tribes were classified as criminal tribes by uh, what was known as the criminal tribes act of 1870s passed by uh, the british when they were in power in india but what this law did was to really tap into the rationale of the institution of caste uh in saying that you know these were communities that were hereditary criminals or were criminals by birth and it it did give the police these wide ranging powers uh you know to control these populations that according to them were addicted to committing crimes which included you know maintenance of these registers uh, that included the fingerprints of these communities and other details and what we are we've seen post independence which is in 1947 is really the upholding of this legacy of caste discriminalization that the british set into motion and we've seen that through this really nebulous category of what is known as habitual offenders right uh, these are communities that included the communities that were characterized as criminal by the british and what these habitual offenders provision do is give the police a wide range of vast discretionary powers uh, that on the face of it appear neutral but are targeted you know against these certain communities and one of the aspects of this is really maintaining these databases and in the form of registers in police stations right so these habitual offenders are called history sheeters and these databases really include really extensive details about their lives and their daily movements uh, and they include you know demographic details such as place of residence caste uh, personal information such as their age identifying marks on their bodies or anything that the police suggests can be an evidence of their criminality right uh, you know such as their habits and how they commit crimes and this is a register that has been maintained in over 70 years of uh the existence of the so called independent indian state and now what we've seen in the past couple of years is really this push to digitize these registers right and this is all happened uh under this sort of really wonderfully cultivated myth of the neutrality and efficiency of technology so what we've seen and this has happened through this system known as the crime and criminal tracking network and systems all the also known as the ccdns which is sort of like this main and centralized system for maintaining digital records uh this is a system created by the union government of india and on the face of it it's a system that is supposed to you know store information such as you know police complaints and various documents related to a police investigation evidence etc and allows for geo tagging of offenses but what we've seen particularly in several parts of the country and where uh, we work as part of the criminal justice and police accountability project that's in central india is that this digitized system has now become the sort of basis for building on to and digitizing these databases right so we've seen that you know sev all of these registers that so far existed on paper and in physical forms in police stations across the country are now being digitized and have all of these details uh, about those termed as habitual offenders and their family members uh, and is really sort of the basis of predictive policing right so it is you know it says that this the ccdns will allow for objective smart and an error free algorithm so it's basically to say that you know we are now going to predict crime and who is a criminal uh, on the basis of technology which supposedly you know eliminates human error right and mm-hmm. what it really does is create this sort of parallel digital caste system because it is essentially rooted in this system of criminality uh, which is caste is criminality which is the essence of policing right mm-hmm. so what we and you know we really try to explore what are these interests that propel the digitization and usage of you know these digit, di- digital databases and artificial intelligence technologies and the over reliance on it right and it's very simple is is that you know nick was mentioning honeywell it's various corporate interests that really fuel this right so 
there is an app known as Bhopal Eye, which really incentivizes uh, houses across the city to install CCTV cameras, uh, the data for which can be utilized by the police. And a wide range of these policing apps are mm -hmm. essentially determined by various corporate interests. So one in one of our interviews with a police officer, he very interestingly talks about, you know, the citizens of the city of Bhopal as client, right? And it sort of really encapsulates the sort of neoliberal underpinnings of this particular endeavor to digitize policing. And okay. what it does is that it really encodes and, you know, the sort of in inequality in technological and digital forms. And, you know, when I was reading Diana's and essay, which is the March of State Coercion, Patriarchy and Resistance, it really brought together how this sort of untrammeled, un a Czech police power has functioned over a period of time, particularly, you know, when she really powerfully talks about how this has happened in the case of gender-based violence uh, mm -hmm. and has really been used to perpetuate, you know, the patriarchal system of justice in the country. So, Nikita, uh, uh, I, yeah. I think we'll have to, sorry, I'm very sorry for, for cutting in. No, no, no problem. Um, I was just, to, just to keep the, I, I wish we had much more time no, because no, no, what no, you're I, saying I is, is really important. Sure. But we will we will come back to yeah, to absolutely. to pick you up pick up on some of those points which I think are really fundamental where you're you're making an intersection between policing and tech and and the inequalities the structural inequalities that we see being played out so so we will come back to some of those themes in the second round but just to to keep the conversation moving I think you you set up the the discussion very well for for our introduction now to our next speaker who is Olufemi Tawo. Um, who is the Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Georgetown University. Um, and Olufemi was part of State of Power uh, by way of uh, an interview or a, a discussion um, between himself and Ashil Membe, um, which was titled Becoming Black. Um, and a lot of that discussion is very much rooted in, 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 in what Nikita also was, was discussing on, on colonialism. So I'll ask Olufemi to join the discussion now and, and, uh, yeah, and to kick off um, the next part of our, of our conversation. So thank you, Olufemi, for joining us. Thanks a lot. Um, and uh, there are really just kind of four quick points that I want to make. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, what other people have to say. Um, but uh, four things that strike me about this moment that we're in and the developments over the last few decades. Um, one of which the first point is something that um, a number of people have talked about already, but to this phenomenon of the relationship of the state to capital. Um, so recent trends in what in some corners are called public-private partnerships um, in development economics might be called bankable development. Um, but you have different schools of thought amongst elites that are overlapping in certain ways. So the so-called Wall Street consensus, but even the uh, Macron consensus, which uh, positions itself as a critique of financialized development and privatization, um, but um, as uh, Economist Dongo Samba Silla com comments, not so much um, in the particular elements of overlap, which is just a functional relationship of the state to capital and vice versa. So we see it in um, private security, um, the use of private security by states. We see it in the use of private technological interventions by states and the use of companies to or the use of the state by companies to create markets for themselves um, but what we have is a uh, increasing coordination of the state in a particular role to capital as a de-risker or a um, transfer of security um, so these policing apparatuses that get built um, essentially perform in broad social life, the role that public-private partnerships in development um, play for investment portfolios, which is uh, private companies, investors will provide capital in order to make um, infrastructure changes 
in um, parts of the world, especially in the global south. And the state will essentially structure those infrastructure developments to insulate the owners of the portfolios from certain kinds of risks, both social and financial. So they will charge, for example, user fees to um, the populations that are supposedly having their lives improved by these infrastructure investments, these toll roads or whatever they are. Um, and what these are at the level of geopolitics are transfers of risks. Um, policing and private militaries perform similar functions um, rather than the people trying to make money by um, building natural gas facilities, for example, bearing the social and economic risks of doing that. Private military companies um, shift that onto the local population using guns. Um, but whether it's guns or user feeds, or user fees, um, security flows in the direction of the rich and powerful and insecurity, danger, risks of criminalization and incarceration and the um, effects of conflict flow downwards towards the people at the bottom of racialized class hierarchies. Um, so that's the first point. Um, the second point is another point about this kind of tacit partnership between the state and capital, which is accelerated in the neoliberal age and in the post-Cold War age, um, which is just the sheer scale of upward redistribution, which is made possible by this buddy-buddy relationship between the state and capital, which is something um, Ashil and I talked about in the interview. Um, so so just, just some numbers. Um, Gabriel Zucman estimates that the um, value of holdings by individuals in tax havens across the world is about 8.7 trillion USD. BlackRock controls about 7.3 trillion USD in assets. Um, UBS, comparatively small, less than half of that, controls um, 3.5 trillion in assets. And the entire African continental trade area, um, the combined GDP of the 54 African countries is less than all those numbers, $3.4 trillion. So these numbers don't tell us anything that we don't know in terms of um, qualitatively who has more money than whom. Um, but they do give us a sense of the scale of upward redistribution globally that has been made possible by the kind of neoliberal moment that we're in. Um, and so that is in and of itself the second, I think we can kind of read the writing on the wall from there. So there's two more points. Um, third point, what do we do about this? What is a political response that makes sense? Of course, um, people will uh, disagree about these things, but I think what this is at bottom is a crisis of government, of governance, uh, where the technocrats, the state party elites, and the corporate elites have found ways to unite efforts. And so I think a response that makes sense, a kind of category of response that makes sense is um, what some um, people refer to as community control. Um, so that goes beyond formal public control in terms of state ownership. Um, that, that criterion might be necessary, but it's far from sufficient as we've seen in the neoliberal age. Um, but a change in governance apparatus where um, important political decisions are made at the community level whether it's um, community control over water or community control over energy. Um, there are conversations in South Africa and the United States and elsewhere um, about these sorts of things. But that's a genre of response that makes sense in this political moment. Um, and that target raises the fourth and last point, which is just a tactical question about how we get there from here. Um, I'm sure lots of people will have lots of ideas. One idea that I've been fascinated by and thinking a lot about is something that's emerged from recent trends in union organizing here in the United States, where um, 
more and more unions are using an approach to bargaining that they call bargaining for the common good, where um, community organizations and um, unions co-produce demands to fight for using um, workers bargaining and potentially the mm -hmm. strike tactic um, and fight together for those demands. It's particularly usable in public sector unions that are bargaining directly with state institutions, but uh, potentially um, in other organizations as well. Um, there was a union local of the SEIU, Service Employees International mm -hmm. Union, that led what um, Labor Notes called the first climate strike, where they bargained with their employers over not just um, the bread and butter issues of wages and working conditions, but also um, sexual harassment policy and also the um, emissions level of the cleaning materials that they use. And so it's a way of expanding what can be, um, what is fought over in using organized workers' power. And so I think that's something worth thinking about, something worth talking about as we try to confront recent trends in global politics. Thanks. Thank you, Femi. Um, perhaps, Arun, we could follow up with, with you um, and, and perhaps leaving off where Femi has just, has just finished. Because uh, one of the things, one of the reflections I've been having around, um, particularly in the US context, is of course we saw that it was, it was astonishing the way that abolition became on, on part of the public debate. Um, uh, and that was that was quite a quite a shift, um, and possibly hard to imagine a few years previously. But the, uh, as those struggles now kind of pan out to actually shift in the entrenched power systems, um, and we've seen this in places like Minnesota, uh, the system, of course, which is about entrenched power, and there's no more entrenched power than one that combines security and corporate power together um, is proven very hard to shift. So I was just wondering, and you have some reflections towards the end of your piece too as well about how how this, you know, what, where we can learn from history, but also, you know, some of the ways forward in trying to find the cracks in the system where we can kind of advance. Um, and also reflecting on Femi, some of Femi's suggestions around kind of building these systems of community control. Love to hear what you thought. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you're, you're, of course, it, it, these, the, you know, we had even even though we had, you know, probably the largest um, kind of street movement in the US in um, in decades last year, um, that doesn't, of course, automatically translate to very much um, in terms of in terms of institutional change. So, um, you know, we we. I think thinking about the last few years, we've had, um, you know, we've had various things tr that that kind of opened up in ways that in the U in the US. I'm talking about the US specifically in ways that um, we hadn't seen in a long time, right? So the, um, you know, for someone like Bernie Sanders to be the most popular politician in the US and um, and at least have a shot at becoming the Democratic candidate in a in an election that that would have um, you know, I think that the way the Democrat would have won whoever he, he or she was um, last year, um, uh, you know, is a sign of, of, of these kind of um, broader shifts in opinion that have, that have been the result of, of organizing and, and kind of political work that's been done on the ground for, you know, for um, over the last 10 years or so coming out of Occupy Wall Street and so forth, right? So what, you know, what's happened is, is that we, is that there was a, there was a, an enthusiasm um, for an electoral approach, um, and that failed last year. And and um, the you know I think the street movements have to be seen in that in that context, right? People are exploring whatever avenues there are to to try and bring about these structural changes. And it's and it's there's a there's a kind of I mean we're talking about you know if you were on those street protests, talking about I don't know I'd say from my experience of being on them, the average age something like 18 you know really young kids um and and they're learning you know that's what these protests are about they're, they're learning um 
what the weaknesses of the system might be, what works, what doesn't work. And, and that's, you know, that's not going to translate into anything immediately, but it's, it's, it gives me at least optimism um, that over the coming years, that energy will go somewhere. And in that sense, it is, um, you know, I mean, I think in US history, we are, you know, it's possible to imagine, put it that way, it's possible to imagine that we are at the opening point of one of those uh, moments that we've experienced before in the US, um, I think probably twice. One, you know, the, the moment of reconstruction after the abolition of slavery um, in the 19th century and the moment, um, if you like, a kind of second reconstruction uh, um, in, in the late 60s, early 70s. And um, in both of those moments, some of the, the, the kind of um, structures of power in the United States that, that seemed um, impregnable were, were opened up and challenged, at least temporarily. Um, and, and the way was pointed towards, you know, real deeper long-term change um, that, it, you know, on those occasions previously, um, you know, was, was um, held back. But I think, you know, we keep fighting and we keep, and we keep looking for those, those cracks in the system to prize open. And I think we have enough, you know, we have an, we're in another of those moments where, where there's an opening like that. Um, and and um, what we can certainly say is that that all of the efforts that have been done by um, you know the, all the, the kind of panoply of NGOs and and kind of progressive um, lobbying that has existed in the United States um, through the era of the war on terror, um, you know, none of that delivered anything. Actually, it didn't stop. It didn't stop. Um, you know the, the vast violence of the war on terror. It didn't stop the progressive uh, constant expansion of military budgets under whichever president. Uh, so, you know, even set against that as, as the alternative, the, the, the protests that we've seen over last year are already moving more, I think more effectively than, um, than, than those kind of attempts to change the system from within. Thanks for that, Arun. Um, maybe moving the conversation uh, back to, to Philippe Dassa, who I introduced earlier on, um, and inviting Philippe to join us for, for uh, maybe in response to a question that, um, yeah, I suppose one of the issues in that you discussed in, in the paper in State of Power was around this kind of contradiction in a way that so much state power is invested in the military, but at the same time, so much of that power is then outsourced to, to private companies. Um, and I think you, you discussed yeah, the role of private companies in, in the earlier presentation, but maybe to, to understand why, why it's beneficial for states to, to outsource so much of their power to a third party and, and what, are they, what are the gray areas that they're, where they're gaining in, in doing this? If you can touch a little bit on that, Philippe, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nif. And well, I think that the, the one of the first points that we need to pay attention is the profit. I mean, that the um, states are focusing on uh, maximizing the, the profits uh, instead of, you know, uh, taking care of the public interest in terms of uh, public security. And if one of the one of the key examples was, uh, for example, uh, the case of Dick Cheney, Dick Cheney, uh, um, former vice president of U.S., who was also, you know, director of uh, Caviar. Uh, Caviar is one of the uh, big uh, PMSCs, who was one of the major profiters in the, in the, in the war in Iraq. And, and this shows, you know, also that the, how profit is, 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 a, is an important element. Uh, but I would say also that um, in, our, in our article, we also mentioned, you know, the, 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 the interest of states to, to use uh, private military security companies as a, as a tool to interfere and, and influence uh, national domestic, domestic affairs from other countries. And uh, for example, the case of Libya, Syria, uh, and also which has, was also very connected to the, to the, to the goal to control uh, territory and, 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 and uh, res natural resources from, from other countries. And, and I think that the, this capacity um, of uh, interfering is also quite connected with a public and, and, and uh, democratic over, over, over uh, private military and security companies. I think this is something that the, that the states, uh, you know, they, they use to, to conduct uh, undercover and, and let's say uh, uh, without 
less public control uh, operations in, in other countries. And that's why, for example, countries like, uh, like US, UK, and other European countries, also China and Russia, that are blocking and they are blocking international regulation of PMSCs um, um, at international level. Like, for example, in the Human Rights Council, um, um, we saw that the, an important, you know, position, you know, from this stage, you know, to stop this regulation and, of course, to, to stop this uh, international control. I think that in terms of the, the regulation, it will, is, is a key element um, uh, on the discussion of, uh, you know, how to control and to stop the outsourcing of uh, uh, um, uh, public security functions. I think one of the key gray areas is, is, uh, is, in, is related to the idea that the, these companies, they have a, a transnational nature. And this transnational nature is like, for example, represented uh, like uh, in, in an image where you can see like a uh, US PM, uh, private military, military companies uh, contracted by, you know, like uh, countries or states like from Nordic countries, but operating in Iraq or, or Syria. So this uh, transnational nature uh, needs an, an international regulation in, in order to, to establish a specific mechanisms uh, for accountability and reparation of, uh, of victims and, and communities affected by human rights violations from, from these companies. And, and I, this is one of the key elements. One, another key element that should be also um, focused is which type of functions uh, could be outsourced you know, to this type of companies. Because we are um, observing uh, how the, these companies are uh, offering services uh, related to combat operations, you know, law, law enforcement tasks which is, should be some specific, uh, there are sensitive uh, you know, activities that should be under the control of, um, under the democratic control, you know, of, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, parliament and, and different, uh, you know, watchdog organizations. So I think this is a, a key element as well. And in the last, in the last year, we saw also another important element that um, is the cybersecurity activities that there are operated by, by these companies. And, and this creates a, 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 or pose more challenges, um, you know, for, for regulation and for uh, you know, democratic control, because we see how this, uh, these companies are uh, contracting hackers and to, op to operate or to uh, operate remote activities. And sometimes these type of activities are, you know, uh, cyber attacks, you know, to critical mm -hmm. infrastructure. And I think this is one of the, of the key elements. So I think that the, um, I think that the, the sector is evolving um, and is getting uh, and expanding, you know, uh, to other countries, but also to other, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, spectrums, no? like this uh, civil security uh, in, uh, realm involvement. And, and I think that we have to pay to, to try to, to focus on, on regulation at the international level, but also a national level. These both combinations are important and to pay more attention to the privatization of, of war and security. Thanks, Philippe. Um, I, I want to extend a bit about the, um, the point about privatization, because it seems one dimension of that, and we know of neoliberalism, is the kind of individualization of these things. And we see that very much in terms of security, um, that, that everyone now is encouraged to set up their own surveillance system. Um, in America, in the US, it's, it's Amazon Ring, you know, on every doorstep. And I think you explore that as well, Srijana, there, that one of the challenges you face is that people would argue in favor of more surveillance and security that, and particularly after things like the shocking rapes uh, that, that got kind of international profile in 2012, there was, it ended up actually reinforcing some of these trends of, of uh, policing um, and, and surveillance. So I was wondering what your, what your thoughts were about how to kind of tackle this um, really kind of citizen-led support uh, for some of the very same trends that often end up oppressing and marginalizing particular communities. So, so some, some reflections on that, on that and, and some of the strategies that you also think of that we need to kind of adopt to take on this kind of citizen consent, even support for policing and surveillance. Right, so uh, I just want to start by answering that the way Indian society is structured is that a lot of the hierarchies that exist um, are perpetuated through like enforcement uh, of, of a lateral surveillance and there's a deep distrust 
uh, and, and a hate that is actively being uh, fostered by agencies of the state by unilaterally, you know, pinning the blame for certain uh, law and order activities, uh, either on marginalized caste communities. And this is seen by the number of, uh, by the overrepresentation of individuals from marginalized communities for different kinds of um, offenses uh, in the underchild population in India, but also the sort of vilification of religious minorities and blaming them uh, and, and blaming a certain class of men who inevitably, uh, and it inevitably belong to a certain caste because uh, you know caste determines one's um, economic access and economic power in Indian society. So there is a, a, a sort of deep distrust of these individuals that is fostered. There is a myth of criminality and a narrative of criminality about these communities uh, that all agencies of the state play different uh, roles in like actively building or insidiously perpetuating. Um, it, it's not only the state, we also have, you know, um, a news media, news media and, and corporations um, are benefiting from that kind of uh, narrative. And what, what that sort of deep distrust and, and narratives of criminality, of otherization of uh, minority, marginalized caste and religious communities has done is that it's convinced people that policing um, and disproportionate arbitrary surveillance-based policing is one the way to tackle uh, social problems in India. Uh, and two, that this surveillance-based policing needs to be constant, it needs to be blanket, and it needs to believe that everybody from a certain kind of class, community, caste is suspect, unless through their good behavior, they're able to demonstrate otherwise. So in a city like Bhopal, we were having uh, the Bhopal I app where the police is actively encouraging people to install CCTV cameras in their neighborhoods and their uh, you know, private establishments. And when crimes are being committed or are thought to have been committed in these specific geographic spots to give the police access to the feeds of these cameras. Um, and, and even social justice movements in India, particularly the feminist movement, have not adequately reckoned with this uh, question of how the criminalization of communities happens. And so what you're seeing is both, uh, I think as Nora uh, was saying, you know, security is a, a very um, a profitable industry. You see both, uh, you know, private companies as well as the state really, uh, uh, tapping into citizens' anxieties, amplifying it, uh, and, and then creating products or creating services uh, to, to show people that there is, uh, to show that there is like, or to build like a facade of law and order without actually making any attempts to address the institutional root causes of, of why those criminal activities take place and also why only certain communities uh, are, are criminalized. And the way to tackle this is to one challenge the the myths of objectivity, the the sort of uh, narratives of criminality, the policing practices that come about, but also to build more social solidarity amongst uh, different groups. Um, so yeah, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Shujana, for your for your input, and maybe just to to bring Olufemi back into the conversation again. Um, and maybe touch on something that I think we probably all agreed that uh, underpinning all of the, the, you know, the structures of state uh, course of power and militarism is probably the, the well, the legacy of colonialism. Um, and one of the questions that's discussed in, in your interview also with Ashil Bimbe is, is um, uh, I think the way that you discuss it is, is that even though a territory or a country has been decolonized, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's free of coloniality. Um, and I suppose, yeah, so much of what we've discussed today is it, 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 it's basically that in practice. You know? So how are we to understand, I suppose, that you know, some of the governments or, or states that are implementing these policies have been decolonized, but they're implementing colonialist policies or dynamics. So how are we to, yeah, to understand this, I suppose, and what and how it underpins the, the course of power that, that we're talking about today? Yeah, it's, um, 
It's interesting. Um, I think there's a growing interest um, on the academic side of things um, in um, seeing what the relationship is between colonial institutions and, um, or I guess I should say formerly colonial institutions and the present ones that we have. I mean, for me, it's just the same story start to finish. Um, so um, there was a period of colonial conquest starting from the 15th century um, and, you know, ending by some people's calendars in the 20th century. Um, much of that was corporate led. Um, so, so Jamestown Colony here in the States was founded by the Virginia Company, which was a joint stock company of which King James I was a shareholder. It was the Royal Company of Africa, the Dutch East India Company, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so at different points of these centuries, there's been um, different configurations of the state and the corporation. Um, but a lot of what we think of now as identity categories were just very explicitly colonial population management techniques, extremely explicitly. Um, they would segment the population and order them in terms of, um, at some times they opportunic, opportunistically um, absorbed and mutated existing social divisions. Um, in the case of race, they, um, to some extent, invented um, social categorizations um, by lumping people together who had not been lumped together previously, or at least not in their own political geography. And, and the goal of all of this was, are, are basically the things that we've been talking about in, in different aspects, you know, that, that everyone's been talking about. Um, how do we secure investments and secure people, the people who we think are worthy of bodily protection? Um, and because we're colonizers, our preferred method of making those people safe is by making sure that certain other people, people who are marginalized by the categories we've made up, like race, or categories that we've found exploitable, like caste, um, by making those people's lives dangerous, by marking them for criminalization, by marking them for dep deprivation, by marking them for certain kinds of um, qualitatively different and just quantitatively different levels of exploitation. And the characters change the geography changes, um, the justifications change, but by and large, the stakes of these colonial management techniques um, survive quite different economic modalities. The, they survive the shift from mercantilism to capitalism. Um, they survive different geopolitical realities. They have survived the shift from formal colonial rule to what people called neo-colonialism. Um, they've survived the, cold, the end of the Cold War. Um, and they are institutional logics that work because of how they arrange incentives much more so than um, how, you know, how they arrange specific groups of ideas about who genuinely is worth protection, who genuinely is not worth protection. And so I think that's why um, so many of the articles in these, this series have been so clarifying, because if you track Honeywell's profit margins, if you track Blackwater, if you track what Dick Cheney is up to, and you just count what dollars um, are in it for the people atop these organizations, all these institutional moves make sense. All these investments in AI technology, all these investments in border surveillance and border security, you know, someone wins in, in ethereal 
security ways or in very material um, senses of uh, profit margins and asset value. Um, and this is the kind of analysis that I think is going to be, this is the only kind of analysis I think that is gonna be clarifying and otherwise impossibly complex world that racial capitalism has set up um, and that continues to complexify as the financial sectors and um, and technological revolutions make the world harder and harder to understand. Thanks, Bermi. Um, uh, we we all run out uh, run over a little bit, so I just want to just kind of but I, just before closing, I'd like to do a a very final short round, um, just one minute interventions. Um, and and this is a subject which sometimes can get depressing. It's it's uh, it's it's quite a dark subject at times. And I think um, what would be nice to end end with is if is from each of you to kind of tell a story or an example or perhaps a model of something where both a, a movement or where cracks have been made in the system, something that's inspired you in this area, um, just to from your own context of something that's. That, that has given you hope um, in your own particular struggles in this area. So um, just to hear some stories and also some stories of hope um, and some examples that we can also draw inspiration from in our own struggles. Um, so just a, a quick a quick round. So we'll, I think we'll start with um, Arun, if that'd be with, okay with you. Just Just a short one, just something that keeps you going right now. Uh, I mean, I think the, the, the thing that that, um, that I think of on that recently is is what happened at the Standing Rock protests here in the United States um, against, you know, the Standing Rock protests against the pipeline that, that would have, um, you know, been another layer of dispossession for Indigenous people here. And um, uh, one of the things that happened in the midst of that was um, a, a about 5,000 veterans of the US military um, came to the protests and um, uh, met with indigenous leaders um, and, and kind of engaged in a kind of um, apology and reckoning with, with the history of violence that uh, against indigenous people that the US military had has historically and continues to um, perpetrate and, and uh, as as part of a kind of process of reconciliation and reparation, actually, um, uh, you know, kind of committed to um, solidarity with the indigenous struggle there against the pipeline, right? And and it's a you know it's something that is in some ways quite a quite a kind of small event, but it, it does it does seem to me um, inspiring, both because it's it's um, addressing you know, very contemporary issues, but with that sense of history um, of oppression in, you know, in in play in in that engagement, and um, and, and, and you know, it it I think um, puts it, it enables you to um, to to move away from any assumptions that any group of people in the United States uh, and for that matter anywhere else, therefore, um, is cannot be. Um, won over to the kinds of causes that we are fighting because because US veterans are um, you know perceived as the most conservative defenders of everything we're opposed to. Um, on this occasion, they were the opposite. Thanks, Arun. Nora or Philippe, I don't know who wants to in intervene on your side. Okay, I will go and maybe Philippe will add something else after me. So for me, the fact that there are debates on the police and on the policy, you no, know, on public security model in many contexts, uh, struggles against uh, large military and private security companies, you no, know, that, that then in in victories, like we we expose some of them in our you know, in our contribution, and of course the fight to regulate the activity of of these companies in the security model that we all have in our heads, they should not exist. But there have been victories, uh, for instance, um, on the case of GS4, G4S, sorry, one of the biggest or, or the largest companies, you know, uh, private and military security. 
uh, sorry, um, military, you know, private security companies, and they they were in Palestine, no, and and BDS and other organizations uh, get a big uh, victory, you know, uh, for the fight, and they had to to leave Israel or at last to change their name. Maybe Philip no wants to add something on that on that concrete case, but for us it it um, proof no that fight gets uh, results. So. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that you, you explained very, very well. I, I think that the one of the uh, one of the key ideas as well that it was not only a, a, a campaign that it was uh, you know uh, lead you know by let's say by. Um, by, by Europeans, but it was also, you know, uh, uh, Palestinians, uh, uh, activists and, and communities, but also uh, uh, activists from Tunisia were, you know, uh, advocating and, and uh, in the in one of the most important G4S office in, in Maghreb region. So I think it was a, like a global a global action and a global pressure that managed, you know, to 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 put to put enough uh, um, pressure over over G4S. I think it's a very good uh, example of uh, victory. Yep, and on that, there's a great essay um, uh, by on on the whole issue of Israel and the security state within the series that I recommend, um, and it just very much speaks to the importance of this kind of internationalist organising. That's how we have to work. So, over, uh, Femi, over to you. I don't think I. Yeah, I'm not. I don't have too much more to add other than just a a plus one on the internationalism. You know, I'm always, I'm always struck by, you know, how, how little constrained these companies are by borders um, in their, in their ability to, um, essentially, co-opt different states in the world into de-risking their investments and providing markets, essentially converting populations into markets for um, their, for their, you know, various plans and converting state budgets into revenue streams. Um, and so I think you know, the challenge of the next few years will be reconciling kind of local focus with the transnational um, nature of the people we're opposing locally and the companies we're opposing locally. Um, and the more we figure out ways of doing that, the better off we'll be. You speak very much to the heart of, <laughs> heart of our soul and identity at TNI. So thank you for... That's very much, very much at the heart of what we do, Liam, and really believe it's important to kind of re-inject an internationalism that in some ways has got lost a bit on the left and really needs to be re-energized. And finally, over to either Nikita or Sujana. Um, so last year, uh, when India had the lockdown, there was a lot of uh, civil society organizations that stepped up to fill in when the state hadn't uh, was in providing to citizens and for me that was a sign of uh, inspiration also during the lockdown in the southern state of Tamil Nadu there had been um, a case of custodial violence that had uh, you know wherein the police were guilty of um, assaulting and, and murdering two individuals who were um, very arbitrarily picked up by the police for violating like administrative regulations by about five or ten minutes a uh, really minor issue, but they were kept overnight. And um, unfortunately, uh, uh, they were murdered. And um, uh, of course, that is horrible. But uh, I'm glad that the incident actually brought um, a lot of people to in India, uh, not enough, but still a lot of people to discuss, uh, you know, how much powers the police have to, to have a conversation about the caste-based nature of policing and caste discrimination by the police and, and to really unpack these uh, conversations about reform. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, I am a young person. I haven't like 
awkward conversations from long ago, but at least in my short time, the the conversations really moved from a little bit from from ideas of police reform to ideas of police uh, structural overhaul because this is a system that is designed to oppress and and keep uh, sustained violence on the bodies of marginalized individuals. So to have that conversations come up. Uh, not so much in mainstream media, but in some sections of mainstream media was, to me, a, a, a sign of inspiration, a sign of hope. Nikisha, did you want to come in or you're Yes, with... also the farmers' protests. I mean, uh, through a raging pandemic, we've had one of the worst second waves in the world. Uh, but the farmers' protests in India have continued. Uh, and I think, you know, in the last seven years, uh, we've, you know, lived in a fascist regime, and I think this is the farmers' protest is uh, one of the strongest challenges, at least after the CANRC protests that happened uh, in 2019, is one of the strongest challenges uh, to the fascist regime that has is currently in power in this country. Great, thank you. I think that's one of the, yeah, to end on a positive note, I think is, yeah, to take those examples with us um, as we go through the, the content of state of power. Um, unfortunately, we've, yeah, we have to bring the discussion to a close. Um, it's very short and it doesn't entirely do justice to the enormity of, of the content in this year's state of power, but hopefully it will give uh, our, our audience flavor of the richness of, of what the, the publication contains. Um, so please do check it out. We've been sharing some of the links in the chat throughout the discussion. Um, so you can access it uh, at any of those links. Um, before we finish, maybe just one quick announcement that we will have a webinar on the 24th of June. Um, and it's uh, it's looking at the, um, the resistance movement in Algeria, Morocco, Sudan and Western Sahara, um, 10 years uh, uh, in our Arab Spring 10 year series. So you can um, you can tune in again for that coming up on the 24th of June. Um, you can also register for the TNI newsletter um, to receive updates on our publications and any such events. Um, and if you are in a position to be able to donate to TNI, there's also a link where um, we would be uh, yeah, very grateful to receive any donations. Um, so finally, to, to thank our speakers, before we close, I'd like to thank Arun, Philippe, Nora, Srujana, Nikita and Olufemi for the really, really rich discussion today. Um, and also thanks to all of the other um, contributions, so all of those who, who participated in State of Power, who unfortunately we couldn't have on the discussion today, but many thanks to them. Also thanks to Noor, who, who participated by way of their wonderful photography. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just to thank Nick uh, also for co-moderating, to thank Josephine, Jess and Hiwan in the background, who've been helping with the chat, um, and to thank our audience for, for tuning in and following our discussion. So for that, um, we leave it here for today. We leave the chat open Open for another few minutes if people want to, to exchange in the chat but for now we'll we'll close off the the live discussion so thanks very much everybody bye bye <laughs>